Lord, we, uh, we recognize that we're, we're nothing without you, Lord. Lord, this morning we, we recognize that, <clears throat> that you're here, that you're present, Lord. Lord, we approach you with a, with a sense of adoration, with brokenness, Lord, over our sin, Lord, and over our rebellion against you, Lord. When we rebel, Lord, we come before you, Lord, just recognizing and understanding that that e even when even when we run from you, even when we rebel against you, you still passionate, you're still loving, you're still forgiving, Lord, and you don't give up on us, Lord. So many times, Lord, we, we've run away only to find you back again, Lord. At the end of that misery, Lord, you with open arms, Lord, just welcoming us back, Lord prodigal father receives the prodigal son this morning Lord we recognize that you're here present we don't understand how Lord and, and we may not even, even fully recognize that reality Lord but you are here, you are present you are glorious Lord, thank you Christ our King Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. We pray that, that your Spirit here this morning, Lord, would just overflow in people's lives so much that the broken would be healed, the, the, the brokenhearted, Lord, would be mended, Lord, the, the wounded physically, Lord, would be made whole once again, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would be so powerfully demonstrated, Lord, that there would be moments of reconciliation, Lord, moments of, of sweet surrender before your throne unto your feet, Lord Jesus. Lord, stir our affections. Holy Spirit, stir our affections for, for Jesus. Then we may live in a way that, that is pleasing to Him, and that we may live in a way that, that He is delighted in us, Lord. Jesus, we thank You this morning, and it's in Your name we pray. And everybody here, on site and online, together with one voice, said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you are a, a veteran, would you please stand up if you're a veteran? All right. Yeah, thank you so much for those of you who are veterans. You have served for this nation. You have served under the banner of our beloved country, right? And you have gone out there to places and, and that many of us uh, didn't, didn't do. And uh, you did it for the glory of God, for the benefit of the people here in our country. And we thank you this morning. Thank you for your service. Really appreciate you guys. Yeah. Thank you guys again. Uh, let's uh, go before the Lord in prayer to prepare our hearts uh, so we can get started this morning. Lord, Father, we thank you, Lord. We pray that you would uh, just open our hearts, Lord, open our minds to understand, our hearts to feel, Lord, not just understand mentally, but to feel as well, Lord, to feel um, what it means, Lord, to be radically in love with you. Uh, help our will, our, our, our will, our rebellious will be bent back, Lord, to to you, Lord, and that we may serve you and worship you and, and, and obey you in ways, Lord, that maybe perhaps even this morning we would think it would be impossible. But today, Lord, we pray that your spirit, Lord, would just move in such a way that you make possible the impossible. Um, there's a lot of people, Lord, out there that, that um, are suffering, Lord, that have pain, uh, that have grief, Lord, that, ha that are sick, Lord. Uh, Father, we just pray that that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would bring about miracle, a true miracle. That we do pray, Lord, that, that the sick would be made well. Um, whatever that looks like, Lord. 
And yes, it, for some it may look like, like it's, it's going to be through doctors, Lord, your, your process of healing. And for some, Lord, I, we, we do pray for the miracle, Lord, of instantaneous healing, Lord. We still believe, Lord, that you work in this day and age, Lord, to bring glory to yourself in that way, in that manner. And so uh, we do pray for that, Lord Jesus. It's in your name, Christ, our King, that we pray. Amen. If you brought your Bible, go ahead and open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 9 as we continue our journey through the journal of Nehemiah, which is a very profound, very insightful uh, journal or book of the Bible. So go there to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1. If you brought your U version Bible or your electronic Bible, just go ahead and click it and scroll all the way down and go there. Today we're going to see the longest prayer recorded in scripture the longest prayer it is this one in chapter 9 is the longest prayer that's recorded in scripture and it's believed that Ezra which is the the religious leader of the day the priest of the day the the one that, that was leading the community to draw close to God is the one that is praying this prayer now just because it's the longest prayer doesn't mean that I'm going to go verse by verse because otherwise you're going to be like oh my gosh it's going to be take a long time so I'm going to skip uh here and there on this prayer, this prayer actually has 1,177 words in this prayer. And yes, I did count that. 1,177 words in this prayer. That's a long prayer. But this prayer illustrates, it illustrates the truth of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul talks about godly sorrow produces repentance. Godly sorrow produces produces repentance now now what's the difference here what's the difference between worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow now worldly sorrow is always horizontal worldly worldly sorrow is always horizontal it has nothing to do with god it's when you say oh man i really blew it have you ever been there i really blew it this time and it's being more upset about blowing it and being busted for something than than repentance worldly sorrow is purely emotional and non-spiritual it's just just, you feel really bad because of the consequences because of what happened you feel terribly bad but when the feelings move away you go back to what you were doing that's that's worldly sorrow it's it's passive it's passive towards the cause of sorrow it's passive it doesn't do anything about it matter of fact it, it seems to tame the sin that's what worldly sorrow tends to do. We tend to tame the sin. Okay, I can tame the sin. I'm just going to watch out a little bit more. I'm going to kind of control my sin. That's worldly sorrow. It is full of pride and avoids responsibility. It doesn't seek to run away from the sin. It seeks to make it its pet. At the beginning of this year, I talked about this illustration of a lion, you know, how dangerous a lion is, an apex predator, and and, uh, and the idea is that uh, worldly sorrow is this, I feel bad that this lion can, can chow down on people, but I'm going to try and make it my pet. Th- that's worldly sorrow. That's the worldly sorrow towards sin. Godly sorrow is very different. It's very different. It's, there's clear vision. God opens our eyes to see the reality of what that sin really looks like from his perspective at the vertical level. And, and God takes away those blinders, and we, we're able to see, like, oh, man, this is really, like, not only that it, it is bad for, for, for the people around us, but, man, God sees it, like, you see his perspective, and it, and it tears us apart from the inside. But it's not kind of tearing down of the inside. It's actually a tear down that leads towards the Lord, not away from the Lord. Godly sorrow produces this kind of brokenness that we see in Scripture that we're going to see today in this prayer. There's this brokenness about the reality of our sin in light of who God is, the vertical component. This godly sorrow leads to confession, to confess our sins before the Lord. And it leads towards action. That's godly sorrow. It has an action component. It doesn't seek to make a pet out of the apex predator. It doesn't seek to say, oh, look at that little lion. I'm just going to pet it, make it my pet, and hopefully it won't, won't, won't try and get my, my hand as a, as a slim jim, you know? It doesn't try and do that. It takes the gun and it puts a bullet to the apex predator. That's what godly sorrow does. That's what godly sorrow does. 
And we're going to see that today. We're going to see that kind of godly sorrow in today's passage, in today's uh, chapter. And just to give you a little bit of background, here they are, the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem, they are in a vacant city, knowing that they had historically, historically failed God. And here they are. And they had an initial wave, you know, come in like 70 years prior, you know, and then 150 years. It's been 150 years since, since they've been back. And, and now the question for them is, how do I rebuild? How do we rebuild our walk? Not with the wall, but how do we rebuild our walk with, the, with, with, with God? How do we rebuild that? But I want to let you... Uh, I want to let you kind of give you a little nugget here, and hopefully this nugget will settle in into your heart and it will, will draw a root in there, and that is failure doesn't need to be the end of your story. For some of you, you've allowed failure to be the end of your story. And so you, in, in, instead of drawing back to God, you've decided, you know, I have failed, therefore I'm going to fail some more because that's what I deserve. That's what, that, that's what I must deserve, Right? But failure doesn't have to be the end of your story. There's still hope for you. There's still hope for us. You can have a bright future in spite of a dark failure. Let me say that again. You can have a bright future in spite of a dark failure. And some of you are coming in here with a dark dark failure. You can have a bright future. Let that settle in. Draw roots into your heart this morning. God meets our failures with forgiveness and faithfulness not with vengeance or uh, some somehow like a capricious kind of god is just is looking for to torture us no no no. god meets our failures with forgiveness and faithfulness not with a a sense of like like a little tenter tantrum little boy would deal with a parent dissatisfied with them right that's not our god he doesn't have a temper tantrum if you find yourself in a place that you have blown it, in whatever area of your life you're like, man, I've blown it, or you know somebody that has blown it, we'll be talking about how to rebuild your walk with the Lord. How to have that sorrow, like Paul says, that sorrow that leads to to repentance. That godly sorrow, not worldly sorrow. So we're going to see three key movements towards rebuilding, towards godly sorrow, and three specific lessons this morning. Very simple, very simple. And the first one is this. The first key movement towards godly sorrow is rebuilding always involves honesty. It always involves honesty. Always involves honesty. When you're looking at the rubble of your broken life, when you're looking at your failure... There has to be a measure of honesty from you in how you got there, how you got there. Go to verse 1. It says, on the 12th, I'm sorry, on the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, what are they going to do? Fasting and wearing sackcloth. Sackcloth is very uncomfortable clothing for, that people would use for mourning. They're mourning here. They're, they're, it's very uncomfortable. And having dust on their heads. This is a very symbolic of what they feel inside. They have dust in their head representing outwardly what they feel inwardly. They feel like nothing. Like they feel like dirt. And therefore they put dirt on their faces. It's a symbol of humiliation. In verse 2, it says, those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. This is sanctioned separation, divorce between people that they know they chase after different gods and they're not going to come back to the one true God. And so there's this separation, there's this divorce that's going on here. People are beginning to recognize that is not godly. And then it says, they stood in their places and confessed their sins and wickedness of their, uh, of their fathers. In other words, they, they're, they're confessing, they're, they're recognizing how everything they've done up to that point has violated the very, the very character of who God is. 
In verse 3, it says, They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of a day. For three hours, it is being read. Three hours. Last, last week, we saw that it was six hours, and now they're like hearing it, and there's like three hours, and they're like, they're getting broken just as they see God's word, as they see the very character, nature, and beauty of who God is. All of a sudden, they, they see themselves in contrast to who God is. And the result is, and and they spent a quarter, another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. Three hours of confession, just raw confession. God, this is what we've done. Here we are. And then that leads them to worship. See, that's how you know it's godly sorrow. Because worldly sorrow doesn't lead you back to worship. It leads you back into your muck. It leads you back into further decline in what you were doing before. But not for them, it's they recognize and then they just worship God because they're realizing who they offended, who they sinned against. And they are clearly showing their need for discomfort. Now, we live in a culture that we, we long for comfort. We long to be comforted. We don't want anything to do with anything that's this, uh, uncomfortable. And, and yet they, they are ready to deal with their sin in a very uncomfortable way. They're ready for it. They're ready to go before God. And, and see the, be honest enough to say, okay, here it is, God. Here it is. We never solve anything by sticking our heads in the sand. Never. We never solve anything. We never solve anything by blaming others, by kind of shifting the blame, by saying, well, I wouldn't have done that if he or she wouldn't have done that other thing. Failure is not a time to feel good. It's a time to get sober-minded and be honest, to be honest before God, and then you will find that you will find the comfort that you're, that you're seeking. You will find it when you're honest, when you're going before God, and you're like, God, here I am. And then God, just you feel the, the very forgiveness. You feel the very compassion of God in your life. So there needs to be honesty, honesty. And guess what? Honesty hurts, doesn't it? I mean, I've had those moments where, 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 where peers have called me out on my own stuff, and I'm like, ah, I don't want to hear that. I, and, and I feel ugly, and it's this detestable inside, and yet, and yet it's valuable to, to sit there, to settle there for just a moment at least, and recognize the authenticity of what is being said. And, and the value of it is that if it is worldly, worldly, sorrow you're gonna go back to it again but if it is godly sorrow you're gonna be like i don't want to be that i want god to lead me out of that i want to be much more than what i am there's value in that those moments that i've been called out and stuff that i've done or stuff that people see in my life that there are that are blinders in my in my life that are blind uh blind spots man they have been the most fruitful times in my life when I recognize that, I settle in, in that moment, as ugly as it seems, and then it's like, okay, okay, I'm going to move away from that. And now it comes not from a, from a spirit of, well, I want to v- avoid the consequences. It's from a spirit of, man, I want to be like chasing after Christ. And if that dishonors Christ, man, I'm going I'm to go this direction because I don't want to be there Boy, I was blind and I didn't see, but now I see. There's a very f- clear vision. And God shows you. And all of a sudden, you don't want to be where you, were at, where you were at before. You want to be where God wants you to be. And that's why I say it's uncomfortable at first. It's very, very uncomfortable. But, but when you move in there and you are honest with your discomfort, it leads you to a place of, of satisfaction, a, a place of peace before God. Because then you feel like, man, I'm in the very center in the will of God, and I, I feel the pleasure of God, and, and, and I just, man, it feels good. It feels good. The second thing is this, and that's brokenness always has history. The, third, the second movement towards godly sorrow is, is to realize that brokenness always has history. It always has history. See, they get together and they recognize the history of, of their problem. Let's look at that in verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. 
Let me say that again with a different twist here. Verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Jesse and brought me out of the world and named me a son of God. Now, I want you to do an exercise, and I want you to replace that with your name. I want you to say it, but with your name. Lord, or you are the Lord God who chose Jesse, put your name in there, and brought me out of the world and named me a son of God. Now I want you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I'm a son of God or daughter of God. Now I want you to look at your neighbor, maybe even point a finger and tell your neighbor, you are chosen. I'll do it for the online. You are chosen. Because you are chosen. Verse 9, it says, You saw the suffering of your forefathers in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and all the people of his land. For you knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself, which remains to this day, it says, you responded to the need. They cried for your help, and you responded to the need. In verse 13, you came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right and decrees and commands that are good. Verse 16, but, but, but they, so do you experience all God's goodness? Do you experience his guidance? But they, our forefathers, became arrogant and stiff-necked and did not obey your commands. They refused to listen. They, in other words, they refused to apply the truth of God's word into their lives and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. Isn't the tendency to forget very real? I mean, anytime you, you bump into a hard circumstance, you don't know how God's going to provide or you don't know what's going to happen. And we, we have like this amnesia that happens. We forget that just a month ago or just a year ago, and in some cases just yesterday, God showed himself in your life in very powerful ways. And we're like, oh, what's going to happen? Have you ever been there? You just, we have this natural tendency of just forgetting what God has done. And so, so they, they too had that tendency. And they failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in the rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. Isn't that ironic? We're going to rebel. So we're going we're gonna to find people. They're going to go ahead and justify our rebellion. We're going to find people, uh, relationships, friendships, and maybe even, shall I dare say, preachers that will justify my rebellion, that will minimize the impact of what I'm doing. Just so that I can not feel uncomfortable, just so that I can feel good about myself. We do that too. We do that too. But, but, it's like you were rebellious, but you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Some of you need to hear that because you tend to focus on, oh, you know, I, I sinned. Oh, man, I, I failed again. You need to remember. You need to remember how compassionate he is. How forgiving he is. How gracious he is. How slow to anger he is. How abounding in love he is towards you. Not as a pass. Not as a, okay, pass, I get to continue. But as a really profound awareness. A profound awareness that he loves you. Even when. Even when. Fill in that blank. Even when you're at your worst, and we're going to see that in just a moment, even when you're at your worst, he still loves you. It says, therefore, you did not desert them. You didn't abandon them. You didn't say, you know what, sayonara, whatever. No, no. You didn't desert them. 
in verse 18, even when. I want you to underline that. That's important. Because here he's going to say the worst thing you could do, even when, even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Or when they committed awful blasphemies. In other words, even when they were at their worst. Even at their worst. Even at their worst. When they made idols, when they put other stuff, other things above God, even at their worst, yet he was forgiving, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. Even at your worst. Whatever your worst is, even at your worst. You need to hear that. You need to let that find root in your heart. Verse 19. Because, why? Why even at their worst? Why would he take us? Why would he take them even at their worst? Because of your great compassion. You did not abandon them in the desert. By day, the pillar of cloud did not cease to guide them on their path, nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. Like even at their worst, he was still guiding them. Even at their worst, he was still revealing to them the way that they should go. Even at their worst, he's still right there beside them even at their worst, even when you feel, quote, you feel like he's not there with you, folks, that's just your feelings because he's right there with you. Because even at what? Even at their worst, even at your worst. Even at their worst. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your mana from their mouths and you gave them water for their thirst. In other words, he provided you the essentials. He provided the essentials, which he, they needed that he provided even at their worst. What makes us think he, he doesn't do that for us today? What makes you and I think that if we are chosen, that he has chosen us for himself, we're sons and daughters of him, what makes you think and what gives us the right to change that and say, well, he doesn't love me? Nothing should give us the right to treat ourselves in such a manner, in that way, to say, oh, he doesn't love me anymore. Because even at your worst, whatever your worst is, For 40 years, you sustained them in the desert. They lacked what? Nothing. They lacked nothing. God still provided at their worst. He still provided. What kind of God is this? What kind of God is this? That even at the worst, He would say, no, I I, I love you. Folks, this is the God of the Old Testament who hasn't changed. This is the God of the Old Testament. We we try and demonize the God of the Old Testament. Oh, he's he's a meanie. He's a bully. We try and say, oh, we try and distance ourselves even from the God of the Old Testament. But even at their worst. And God hasn't changed. Even in our worst. Even in our worst. And man, and that's why we cling to Jesus. Because of Jesus, we are sons and daughters. Because of Jesus, he's with us. You gave them kingdoms and nations, allotting to them even the remotest frontier. Verse 26. But, oh my gosh. But we do this too. But they were disobedient and rebelled against you. Verse 29, you warned them to return to your law, but they became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances by which a man will live if he obeys them. You want life? Follow the principles and practices in the person of Jesus and you will have life. Jesus has obeyed every letter of the law. And and follow Jesus and you will have life. You are never more satisfied in him than when you are radically obeying, obeying God by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
A man will live if he obeys them. Stubbornly, they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked. How many times have we heard the word stiff-necked? And refused to listen. For many years, you were patient with them. By your spirit, you admonished them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention. So you handed them over to the neighboring peoples. So finally, he was patient, but finally he, he let them just carry on the consequences of their own rebellion. That's, that doesn't make God mean. That doesn't make God unjust for him to say, okay, you go ahead. He handed them over to the neighboring peoples. But in your, in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them. Like even now that the enemies had overtaken them, even though that had happened, he still didn't abandon them. For you are a gracious and merciful God. See, the theme of history for the Israelite community and for the, historically for the church as well has been one where God intervenes, people rebel, God continues to intervene, we continue to rebel, and at some point, God says, okay, you, you, I'm going to still be with you, but consequences are going to unfold now in your life. Brokenness has a history. I've said this, this phrase so many times. At this point, you should have it memorized. It should be, I don't know, a sticky note. You should have it in your mirror. You should have it somewhere, folks. And that's the principle of the path. The principle of the path. Your direction, not your intentions, determine your destination. Your direction. Not your intentions determine your destination. In other words, where you're headed, not where you want to be, where you're actually headed. The choices you're making is what determines where you end up. You can pray all you want. You can do all sorts of wishful thinking. Matter of fact, when you have your birthday, you can put all the little candles and I'm going like, oh to wish. I'll pfft. You know, and you're like, okay, that ain't going to help. I'm telling you. And you can say, well, I'm just going to pray so hard, still not change my choices, still not change the, the pattern of my life, but I'm just going to pray so hard, I'm going to pray so hard, I'm going to pray so hard, and God is going to somehow land me where I want to be, even though I haven't changed an iota of where I'm at and the choices I'm making. But you're, you're like, but I'm praying, and I come, and I check mark, you know, and, you know, and, and you're like, why hasn't anything changed? Because your choices haven't changed. Because your path hasn't changed. Because your direction, not your intentions, your direction is what determines your destination. It's where you land. And many of us have been blinded by that. We've landed already, and we're like, holy smoke, how did I land here? How did I land where I'm at now? Guess what? It didn't happen overnight. It was a series of choices that were made over a long period of time where God was gracious, compassionate, forgiving, merciful. And we still did those choices. We did those choices. We did those choices. And then we awaken one day and we're like, how did I get into this mess? It was a a series of unwise, unwise choices over an extended period of time. And for, for some of you, it, it took time to get you there, and that's the history. You've got to look at the history. How did I get here? What kind of choices did I make? What kind of turns did I make on that road where I'm, not, I'm now in a different road headed to the path that I'm already in or the outcome where I'm at now? And history can have an, a positive impact in your life because we can look back and say, okay, that's where I made the wrong choice. This is where I made the wrong turn. This is where things started changing in my life. And it, and, it, and it pushes us to realize, like, God was so good. God was so good along the way. And we, we recognize that God is continually good because of his love for you, for me, for his people. And, and, and there's, there's wisdom in going history, his, historic, right, to, to go into our history and say, okay, let me evaluate that as the Spirit gives me the eyes to see. The third movement that leads towards a godly sorrow 
is restoration always requires divine help. It always requires divine help. Restoration always requires divine help. Always. No exception. It always requires divine help. Always. And we're going to see in the conclusion, conclusion of this prayer that very thing in verse 32. It says, Now therefore, O, o our God, the great, mighty, and awesome God who keeps his co- covenant of love, it doesn't say, who keeps his covenant of punishment, who keeps his covenant of judgment. No, no, it says, who keeps his covenant of love. Do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes, the hardship that has come upon us, upon our kings and leaders. Again, they've been 150 years now. 150 years outside of being able to return and, and, and being back, a lot of them being back into Jerusalem. The hardship that has come upon us, upon our kings and leaders, upon our priests and prophets, upon our fathers and all of your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. In all that has happened to us, you have been just. There's no excuse making here. They're not like, ah, you know, you were so unfair, God. No, no, no. They're like, God, you have been so just. You have been so just. You have acted faithfully. Well, we, what we did wrong. That's why when I heard, a, I think I've mentioned this before, when I heard a local preacher here say like, oh, you have to forgive God. He said it in a Lent service. And I was like, what? And another preacher and I looked at each other and were like, what is he talking about? We don't forgive God as if though he has sinned against us. May it never be that we look at God as a sinner, as somebody who has somehow sinned against you and I. Folks, that's not God. Because God is just. He is faithful. He doesn't wrong us in the way that, that we're, where he who exercises sinfulness against us. Verse 34, our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our fathers did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the warnings you gave to them. See, they didn't pay attention. Verse 35, even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. Verse 36, but see, we are slaves today. Slaves in the land you gave our forefathers. They, we're, we're slaves in our own land so that they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Verse 37, because, why are we slaves now? To somebody else. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. It's like, it's like when we really get to the point we really mess up royally and then somebody else gets the benefits of our mess up or the blessings of our mess up, right? It's like we mess it up and the the job offer we're going to get, Bubba over there gets it and you're like, why does he get the job offer? Somebody else is getting the blessing that that, that you were going to get. It was for you. It's like when, you know, something happens in your relationship, your marriage, you're like, man, now so-and-so has my ex-wife or my ex-husband, and they seem to be happy now. Now they have the blessing, but you're like, man, I've messed it up. Somebody else is getting the abundant blessing that was for me, for me or for you. So, but you know what? That doesn't make God unjust. That doesn't make God unfair. That doesn't make God this capricious kind of God that just doesn't care about you and does whatever he wants, you know, regardless of how that may impact you. You see, you know that the consequences in our lives is because of our sin, our bad choices, but we ask, we ask God to intervene. That's what they're saying, God, it's we're fault, it's us, intervene. And the problem with history is that sometimes it's a history of bad choices and bad consequences. It's a history that can't be easily mended. We want it to be easily mended, but it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We didn't get there overnight, therefore it doesn't, 
You don't pull out of it overnight. Now they had to a great hope, and their hope was because they had seen the walls being rebuilt, and they know their walk will be rebuilt too. And they have a great hope, and their hope is that God answer is this is a God that answers prayers. This is a God that restores his people. He restores his people. And he restores you and he restores me. That's a great God. Here's three specific lessons to takeaways that we can take from, from today's passage. And the first one is this. True confession requires precision. It requires precision and ownership. It requires for us to be precise on what we did wrong and own up to it. Don't make excuses. We're owning it. We have to get there. We have to do that. I heard this, uh, read this article just the other day. Uh, on Dan Ble- uh, Leach, who had actually uh, confessed to a murder of his, uh, uh, I think it was his wife who had had, um, who was pregnant. He didn't want her to be pregnant, and so he killed her. And when he saw The Passion of the Christ, the movie, he confessed. As a matter of fact, it reads this way. Dan Lee made national headlines with his response to The Passion of the Christ after seeing the movie Le- uh, Leach confessed to murdering his girlfriend. Ashley Nicole Wilson, her death had been ruled a suicide. But he admitted to strangling her because she claimed to be pregnant with his child. Not wanting the responsibility, he killed her and successfully avoided suspicion until turning himself in three months later. He sees the passion of the Christ, the movie. He gets, he feels guilty. He confesses. The surprise did not end there. On May third 2004 uh, he stunned everyone when his attorney pleaded not guilty for him outside the texas courtroom lawyer lawyer ralph gonzalez explained the decision to reporters if i entered a plea of guilty i waived several valuable rights that i'm not prepared to do so for my client at this time gonzalez told uh, his his uh, uh, leech that if he pled guilty, he would need a new lawyer. And you're like, what just happened? He confesses, but then he fights his innocence. We do that all the time. We don't want to give our right to blame someone. That's not owning it. We don't want to. We don't want to give our right to blame somebody else for what we did, and therefore we don't take full ownership of it. We don't want to forego that right of blaming someone. We don't want to lose the right or give up the right to feel sorry for ourselves. And so we don't own it fully. We don't want to give up the right to have an excuse. Oh, yeah, I did that, but, you know, I did it because we don't want give to the, give up the, the, the right to have a future failure. So we don't want to fully own it all because if I, I don't want to forego the right that, to be able to do it again. God knows how to fix the broken, but you got to own your part. You have to own it. It's yours. Forget about the uh, part of the other person. Concentrate on your part. Number two, pursuing prosperity has a real risk. Pursuing prosperity has a real risk. It has a way of subduing the people of God. We saw that. They were prosperous, and, 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 and so they ran away. You have to be careful not to lose your focus on God. And the real question is, do you pursue life, advancement, your work, your influence, because it's the responsible thing to do, and it, glo- it brings glory to God, and it benefits your family, or you're trying to self-gratify and fill a void that nobody else can fill but God? Brad Pitt was interviewed numerous years ago and uh, by Rolling Stone. And in an interview with them, he had just done the movie Fight Club, which is really about a man who has the American dream and has remained unsatisfied. And this is the, the interview. 
Brad Pitt said this, man, I know all these things are supposed to seem important to us, the car, the condo, the version of success. But if that's the case, why is the general feeling out there reflecting a more impotence and isolation and desperation and loneliness? If you ask me, I say, toss all this. We got to find something else because all I know is that at this point in time, we are heading for a dead end, a numbing of the soul, a complete atrophy of the spiritual being. And I don't want that. And so the interviewer uh, from Rolling Stone asked him, if we're heading towards this kind of existential dead end in society, what do you think should happen? By which he responded, hey, man, I don't have those answers yet. The emphasis now is on success and personal gain he has a huge smile at this point i'm sitting in and i'm telling you that's not it i'm the guy who's getting everything i know but i'm telling you once you've got everything then you're just left with yourself i've said it before and i'll say it again it doesn't help you sleep any better and you don't wake up any better because of it has a success realizes there's nothing more he hadn't discovered what that more is and the reality is is that it's all about god what are you chasing after god or stuff and then lastly sincere thankfulness sincere thankfulness prevents a multitude of sins and there was this history of blessing and they did not give credit to god failure to give thanks to god make us prideful and very critical When we fail to give him uh, thankfulness or be thankful towards God, we start criticizing. Uh, You know, we we start complaining about what we don't have versus what we have, what's been provided for us. We start saying, oh, but I don't have that. Oh, but I don't have this. Oh, but I don't. See, that's not being thankful at all. And I personally think that it is borderline, if not right in their sin, not to have fun. And responsibly enjoy the gifts from God and giving him all the glory for those very gifts. But oftentimes we rather complain. It's like the child who gets the toy and it's like, ah, you know, he enjoys it and then he just throws it on the floor. Enjoys it for a moment and then just kind of distorts the toy. Thankfulness about the goodness of God is so important in your life. And it will prevent a multitude of sins. We need to be thankful. We need to be thankful. Let's go before the Lord in thankfulness. Lord Father, this morning, we realize just like all too often, Lord, that we need to be thankful that you, Lord, are compassionate, you're you're loving, you're abundant in love, you're merciful, you're never unjust. And oftentimes we focus on our pain, or we brew on our pain instead of focusing on you who helps us overcome. We thank you, Christ our King. It's in your name we pray. And all of God's people here on site and online together with one voice said, Amen.